It's a bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I'm your bird nerd with no special science skills. But something some, something a bit different, something I wanted to give a bit of a try. We've bounced into another lockdown in this in this part of town, in this part of the country. And uh, as a as a sort of, I don't know, my 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 part to try and help out the people who rely on tourism in COVID normal. Let's talk about let's talk about COVID normal. We're going to do tour guide Thursdays for a while, and so today's tour guide is Janine Duffy, who is the co-founder and one of the directors of Echidna Walkabout Tours. But the reason that Janine is guest number one for tour guide Thursday is Janine's a bird nut, a birder, one of us, the bird nerds. So welcome, Janine. Thanks for joining me. Let's have a bit of a talk about your tours and a part of the country that we both love. How are you? Oh, great. Grand, it's so good to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me on and for this new series, Tour Guide Thursdays. How has COVID knocked you guys about? Because, well, let, let's do a, a bit of history of Echidna Walkabout Tours. When did you start? What Why did you start and what do you regard as your specialties? We started in 1992. Oh, it's a long time ago. And we actually started with an intention to to get some people into places like East Gippsland to see some of, you know, Victoria's fantastic wildlife and natural places. My partner, Roger, had worked for the Australian Conservation Foundation setting up some of those big national parks in East Gippsland. And one of the things they were talking about in the 80s was how tourism could help a lot of these towns and a lot of these regional areas survive the transition from logging. And he wanted to do it. He wanted to prove that it could be done. And so we did it. It was the best decision I think we've ever made, Grant. When people think about East Gippsland or Gippsland in general, I think a lot of people turn their minds immediately to the high country. But for mine, and Wilson's Promontory, let's not forget that. But for mine, the jewel in the crown is Crowa Jingalong National Park, which is a, a non contiguous series of coastal strips that sort of runs from Malakuta, sort of, gee, how far, well, almost back to not quite as far back as Lake's entrance, but that really wild, remote, beautiful beaches and inlets is all contained within Crow Jingalong. And there's some amazing birds to be seen in there. So you go there, don't you? Oh, yeah. And it's one of my favourite parts of Gippsland and really underrated. I agree, Grant. We started off leading walks along the wilderness coast from French's Narrows near Orbost at the Snowy River Mail, all the way along that 100 kilometres of protected coastline back in the 90s. And I'm really proud to be able to say that seeing ground parrots, seeing plovers, seeing some southern emu wrens, every day I went along there in those days. Was a very so it's helped made me a birder actually. I was very fortunate to do that then. But there is so much in eastern Victoria that Melburnians don't even know about. Jewel in the crown. That's what we've got over there. How many of the neophemas have you ticked off along there? Along there, turquoise. I think we see blue ring parrots over there much, actually. That's all, I think. Well, actually, that surprises me because I've seen blue wings along that 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 lock sport yep. spray yep. area. Further so west. I'm I'm surprised I haven't cropped up on your radar a bit further. All right, though, but, can't go past a Turk. That's a good get. Um, yeah. Ground parrots. How yeah. how do you think they're faring after the fires? No, not good. So quite a few people have put in a fairly intensive effort to find some over near Mallacoota. We ran the Mallacoota Birders Big Weekend in March and a lot of us were looking for them. No luck, none at all. On the other hand, we saw 
about 18 southern emu, which was way more than uh, anyone expected there to be there after that fire. So there's been some, you know, highlights of hope over there, but I think ground parrots were hit very hard, I'm sad to say. That is really bad news, but there, there has, look, let's just preface the, the conversation with, we're talking about the fires that engulfed uh, a lot of the east coast of Australia, and what are we getting on to two years now, isn't it? This will be the third summer, I think, that we, when we come into it, we've had or are we only the second summer? It's only the second summer since the fires. Now, the eastern bristlebird is is one of the specialties of that area that you could almost always you could always hear them if you were in the far east, the scrubby country in Victoria. Are they cropping up nowadays on your tours? We don't take tours so much across to How Flat where they're now occurring, but we do go over there privately ourselves or we, if we've got special birders with us. And they're doing okay, it appears. Most of how flat wasn't burnt, thank God. Thank goodness. I'll never forget actually watching that fire approach, watching it jump the inlet, which was a very bad moment in my life. Because that country on the north side of Mallacoota Inlet is paradise undiscovered. There's so few tracks in there. There's, there's so, it's so underbirded. There could be almost anything there, really. And there's hardly anyone looking most of the time. But I, I was watching that, that fire approach, you know, the, the jewel uh, of Hail Flat. And I happened to be on a pelagic boat trip down at Eagle Hawk neck in Tasmania with Rowan Clark and I I said to him thank goodness how flat hasn't been taken and he said have you looked lately and I said what the last few days he said it's heading that way and we're sending in a rescue mission and I was like oh I thought you know at that stage we thought we were going to lose that as well which you know not only is it the last hope for Victorian eastern bristlebirds but the ground parrots which had, you know, so much of their range taken. They are still living over there. Rowan found a couple of them, I believe, when he was doing research there after the fires, but not nearly as many as they should have found. So thank you, everyone who was involved, putting that out. The the only sort of positive I can ever pull out when I think of the plight of the ground parrot and of course, we've you know the Western ground parrots situation is absolutely perilous. But at least in Gippsland, there are, as you just mentioned, there are so many places where they could be that people very rarely are. And the birders who do go there, maybe two or three times a year, the parrot just might not be hanging around mm-hmm. in that area on the day that they're there. So that sort of knowing how remote and difficult to traverse so much of the eastern part of Victoria is. It's the only thing that you can sort of think, yeah, it'll be all right. I mean, it's not like so much of the rest of the country where people are living sort of cheek by jowl and everyone's familiar with with the area. I mean, as you said, there's not even logging tracks in so much of the country and it was never homesteaded, so the land holdings have not been cut up into 50-acre parcels. There's still massive amounts of public land that is basically not utilised except by four-wheel drivers and uh, motorbike enthusiasts. Virtually nobody else goes in there. Um, you know what really surprised us, Malakuta Birds, which is my Facebook group over there, local named Keith put up a picture of a white-eared monarch in his backyard. Right. Yeah. That, no one saw that coming. This was in March after the fires. We even thought Spectacle Monarch might get into Mallacoota eventually, but no one thought white-eared. But here was a picture and he had a couple of pictures, said they've been here a couple of days. Well, you can imagine the birders in Melbourne who were not allowed to leave due to COVID 
probably steam coming out of their ears, the thought of getting over there. But it gives you some idea. We're talking about you, Dooley. I invented there was everyone who wants it for their Vic list, you know, including me. That's the thing, though, that every – let's try and find a, a, a silver lining here, is that every sort of tragedy like that is an opportunity for birds to extend their range where – they may never have had to if the pressure wasn't on them. So hopefully that means that they'll stay resident in the new areas and that the populations will eventually recover in their old in the old range. But unfortunately with fire, our plant life adapts to fire, but that there's a succession of habitats that happen after fire. You rarely get the same habitat back until maturity, which might be 30 years, might be 40 years, might be 80 years, might be 100 years. So, yeah, be really interesting to see what happens as they, as the special birders that you mentioned monitoring Mm. these these areas. I don't know that there is a silver lining to to that fire, though, Grant. Uh, I think the only one you can see is that, we get our act together now because we can't go through that again. I think to even talk of recovery is sugarcoating. I think there will be a form of renewal, as you say. There will be a different sort of forest that comes back and there will be some animals that that do perhaps extend their range. But it's bad. It's changed everything about our tourism business, by the way, and that's probably a positive thing because... We've lost interest in doing leisure travel for just its own sake. We do conservation travel now, and that's all we do. That's all we're interested in doing. I think we're on a very short timeline, you know, on this planet, and we had better make the most, the best of, uh, of the potential we have with travel. What we've found is that travellers, be they local or overseas, they, if given the opportunity to help, nature they will take it with both hands and they will run with it and so tour operators need to give them that opportunity we need to think of ways of saying to our travelers do you want to help this animal and this is what you can do to help it it's not just a matter of pulling out your wallet this is you know why not clean up this beach why should there be rubbish on it why not pull out these weeds they shouldn't be here Why not submit all our sightings to eBird and iNaturalist and bird data? Because people are there excited to help. They want to change the way they use the planet, I think, and we have a a responsibility to, to give them an opportunity for that. When did your business take that turn where just leisure tourism, which I'm guessing before the pandemic was what paid the bills. When did you pivot? Let's use the jargon. When did you pivot to only be interested in nature tourism, uh, conservation tourism, beg your pardon, and what do you offer to your clients to actually make a difference to, for them to, after your tour, to actively make a difference? We started this slow pivot in about 2012 when we started asking all of our guests to pull out a weed to help a koala, we were not sure that it would work. And some people laughed at us in the industry and said, that's not going to work. Well, you know what? It worked. People loved it. We've since pulled out two and a half million bone seed weeds in the Yu Yangs. And 99% of our guests are so enthusiastic about doing it, you can barely stop them. So tell me how that started. What did you do? Were you driving along on a – because you you do a lot of koala tours, so let's let everyone in in on that. That's one of your focus areas. And, of course, the stronghold for koalas nationally is Victoria. So you – and I use that term advisedly. Stronghold is probably not a word that should be used for koalas or any of our native animals except perhaps the eastern grey kangaroo. But you're driving along, you're on a tour, what do you do? You you know there's a place with thousands of bone seed plants. Do you just pull up and go, hey, 
let's go and pull up a, a plant. Do it for Victoria. It was a bit more organised than that. We had decided we wanted to bring in a conservation action on our tours and we knew that koalas and the yuyangs were affected by bone seed. So the, the way we knew that, Grant, is we take observations of every koala we see in a GPS location and we could map the locations of koalas over the bone seed infestation and found that koalas were not where there was a lot of bone seed. Bone seed. So we thought, let's remove it and see what happens. And we found koalas using trees they had never used within days of us removing the bone seed from around the base. Now, bone seed's stinky stuff. Do you reckon that might be what it is? They don't like walking <laughs> through it to get to an... I think they don't like walking through it. I think they're probably intimidated by what might be in it. I don't think it's nutritional, but they're certainly taking water and nutrients from the trees, but that would take longer than a couple of days to, to benefit the tree, wouldn't it? So I think it's a physical barrier. Yeah, it's a, it's a traffic management issue. And for anyone who doesn't know, bone seed is a South African plant. It's got gro- glossy green leaves. If you know the good eat, the leaves look a little bit like like that, but it's a daisy flower, but it has a, a fruit. It has a droop, as I think it's a droop, as, as, as the seeding body, which a lot of birds, certainly in, in the sort of urban fringes, the blackbirds and birds like that love eating that, and, of course, they poop it out. Now, but bone seed responds to fire. So anywhere where we have some burning, light burning particularly, bone seed loves it. But bone seed also loves sand dunes, loves that loose, friable soil that so much of the country is. It's a horrible thing. It stinks when the weeds are crushed. It has a horrible odour. A bit like what it always reminds me of is, you know, the little cabbage white butterfly moths? And when you're a kid, if you ever squashed one of the one of the caterpillars a smell it smells like that a horrible stinky stuff so i don't blame the koalas for not wanting to go anywhere <laughs> near removing the bone seed yeah there's always bureaucracy when you want to do anything with land management so were you going to private land or to public land and did you ask anyone before you get got started or did you just go hey look at the good stuff we've done Seeking forgiveness after having done it. We're on public land doing it in the Yu Yangs Regional Park, but the park rangers there already have an adopt a block system where they encourage people to pull it out. So we knew we were on very safe ground there, but of course we ran it past them. They were very supportive of it, a bit amazed at how much we managed to do. Our two blocks are enormous, but we managed to keep them clear of mature weeds now. We've cleared 120 hectares over on the eastern side, which just demonstrates that even though we're only taking out 10 people at a time on a day, a small number of people doing something very regularly, doing a little bit very often, is very powerful. In fact, I would suggest it's maybe even more powerful than getting a 1,000 people there on one day that, just because there's the so key. little damage. It's, it's the regular upkeep so that mm-hmm. when a seedling occurs, it gets ripped out. Mm-hmm. It's not so that it's wrist height rather than knee height because mm-hmm. the knee height plant, if it's missed, is then a shoulder height plant and by then it's fruited four or five times. So, yeah. The key is to exhaust the seed bank in the soil and the only way you can do that is to regularly attend and get them. So so how big did you say those two blocks are? One's 120 hectares and the other one it wasn't as infested but we're probably talking another 50 hectares that we've cleared. This was before COVID so it's gotten a bit of a stranglehold again since but we'll get it again. So don't worry, we'll be on top of it. But for me, it demonstrated to us how keen the travelling public were to help. And then, of course, we decided to take it further and push their boundaries. (laughs) So we started to remove ghost nets, the fishing nets off the headland at Cape Conran. Conran, Yeah, 
And that's mm. re- and now you're the first person who's ever mentioned that to me, even in conversation with seabirders. You know, I have never heard of anyone organised going out to pick up that bloody fisherman's refuse, which is on every beach in every pile of rocky outcrop everywhere along the coast. Massive problem for seabirds. And it washes back out. I mean, it might be caught up in rocks when you go there and you think, oh, this is safe and it's too difficult. But you get a storm and it's going to go straight back out there. We've yeah, pulled up it, piles it up, of it. We, crops yeah. up, it crops up in uh, hood, you know, in uh, hooded plover territory or it crops up where, you know, where the fulmar that is paying the one-off visit to the coast in New South Wales, you know, something that's dropped in Mallacoota can easily end up in Port Stephens. In, it's just right. a matter of time. And it's not hard to do this kind of thing. You just need someone who's organised to to figure out what's the best way of doing it. So we'd go in there with some big, strong scissors to to cut the cable and a couple of garbage bags. And each time we went, we'd just take out about two garbage bags worth of the ghost net. And then a couple of years ago, we got it all. (laughs) We're looking for more. It's like we need a new project now. Done. Now, 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 dear listener, if you're wondering why I selected this particular tour company and this particular individual to talk to, this is an idea why. That, you know, what I always say, Janine, is that you can't do everything but just do something. And you're the perfect example of how a very small action can have a massive impact on the environment that we are all walking through day after day, you know. So... If you're at, you know, just say to people, if you're at the pier and you see a bundle of twine all just sitting there and someone's left their refuse behind because they got frustrated because their line got tangled, just pick it up and go and put it in the bin. Or better still, I wouldn't put it in the bin at the pier. I would take it home and put it in your bin so you know that it's not going to be blown out of the bin if a dog knocks it over next to the beach. I would take it as far away from the beach as you can to dispose of it. But these are just little things. That's right. That really is right. And when people are travelling, their mind is very open to new ideas and that's why we travel, you know. I think the sort of traveller who wants to experience a new place, wants to see things anew. And uh, this is a time when you can introduce a concept to someone and doing it is way better than talking about it, you know, but you just do it. And we have a great old laugh. And usually it was, it was, it was accompanied by some alcohol and some nibbles as a celebration afterwards because it was always held just before sundown at Cape Conran. And so it just becomes a, a bit of a highlight of the day. Why not? Why not indeed? Why not indeed? Should be a condition of uh, your permit to operate if you're going into public lands that you do something like this, I reckon. I mean, because we know that the Parks Department, massively underfunded, they can't they can't do all the work with, they're charged with. And in terms of a priority, painting the toilets tends to be more important than actually picking up fishing line off the coast. And I totally get why. I totally get why the priorities are the way they are, but but we need more. We and that's it. We everybody that manages public land is always out there with a begging bowl because there's never enough. So let's use no. the tourists. Let's use the tourists. <laughs> so they want to do it. Motivated tourists will do massive amounts of work, as you have as you have attested to with the bone seed removal and what amazes me is that governments will do things like, well, let's use prisoners, right? Let's use prisoners to do work. Now, I'm not going to knock the work that they do. And the, the prison, there's prison gangs working out there around Gippsland Lakes and whatnot all the, all the time, but they're not highly motivated individuals for that task. So wouldn't it be better to put the funding into people who are highly motivated and actually make a difference? So just mm. putting that out there. All right. Let's talk about your tours. Let's talk about first your specifically B 
bird focused tours. What are you currently able to run and what have you got planned in the, let's say, the medium future? We don't know what's happening in the short term future. We have got some fantastic things in the medium future. And we've been doing a few tours actually in these windows that we've yep. had. Mungo in southern New South Wales is a particular favourite and has been very popular. You know Mungo. I do. I love Mungo. Oh. Been there been there a few times and it's I've been there once one the first time I went was a school tour. So that was very structured and we didn't see much. But the next time I I went on my own and Mungo is a challenging place to be on your own when you spend a fair bit of time because it it gets you, it gets into you and it's hard work if you go there in the warmer months. It's oh, very yes. hard. Work. Oh yes. We, it, when do we have our long holidays in this yeah. So we yeah, we don't do tours at that time of year. I've been there I've been there in the height of summer and it's a really different experience than going there in, in the cooler months, but it's still an amazing place. What we you, have, oh, we have seen some birds there. That's what I want you to tell me about because I, I, I bet I didn't see a fraction of what you saw just simply, <laughs> because, of the, just simply because of the heat. Yeah, it, it's hard. We do it a bit like they do it in Africa in that we go out very early in the morning and even in the cooler months, it's still the best time for a lot of bird activity. And then we come back and have a relaxing lunch at the lodge and then go back out again in the afternoon. We've really found with the arid country, uh, most of Australia really, that the crepuscular lifestyle is so much better for birders and tourists seeing wildlife. And you just modify the, the day around that. I haven't got my haven't got my dictionary on the desk. Oh, sorry. It's so much more of a mammal term. Uh, crepuscular is dawn and dusk active. There sorry, bit... it's not that... something I normally drop in. I don't usually pretend I know what I'm talking about if I don't know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> I'm happy to be the village idiot. So there's a spot I must recommend to anyone who's going there, even if you go there without us, is. Take your dinner, like get toasted sandwiches or something, but take your dinner and your beer if you want it and go to Viger's Well on the other side of the Mungo Ring Road for sunset. No one else will be there because they've all gone home for beer o'clock at the best time of day when there's absolutely everything going on. We've been there when you know, pink cockatoos have been sharing tiny water holes with western grey kangaroos and red kangaroos, galahs and mulga parrots and mallee ringnecks and just everything. Oh, there's crimson chats up there at the moment, orange chats having baths in the water. Yeah, I did see, I did see someone making a fuss about crimson chats coming into the extreme south of their range recently. Yeah. So what are, what are some of the real highlights on the trips that you've made to Mungo that a list-keeping birder would go spare about? The spotted bowerbird that I missed that my partner got hasn't been seen in that area in like a decade. Luckily they got a photograph. But And there were actually a few records in the area at that same time, I think, a couple of years ago. The the chestnut quail thrush is always a bit of a highlight. Very difficult to see at the best of times. That's always a good one. And they can be reasonably reliable in certain spots, but hard to see. That's always the trick. What else? The crimson chats and the orange chats always stand out for me as something special. They're not always there. Cockatiel. Flocks of cockatiels are pretty yeah. amazing when they turn up. It's a white-fronted chat, which is sort of a, a common chat, even though so many people will never never see it. Is that hanging out there too? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. They're, they're the most common one. And so you see them and then there'll be one in amongst there who's an orange chat. Sometimes, 
oh, we saw a budgie fly over once. That was spectacular. We were with a birding group from the US, actually, so it was pretty good. They were very excited. And it's the variability of the arid lands that I find really exciting as a birder. It's not reliable. Nothing's reliable, really, except maybe Mallee Ringnecks. But seeing, oh gosh, it was a noisy firebird, a little firebird, down there near Mildura one time. You know, you get these influxes because of the conditions and good rainfall leads to really good birding conditions for sometimes two years afterward. So some of them come hard on the heels of the rain. Others come later when the vegetation has benefited from the rain but has already gone to fruit and seed and that kind of thing. So it's it it's an exciting time. When you do the Mungo tour, do you swing past Menindi, have a look at the lakes, and do you go to Mootwingy as well? No, we're the slowest tour operator in the whole world, Grant. We tend to go to a place and just stop. So Mungo's enough. We we do a five-day tour. One day is Hatter on the Vic side. Hatter yep. is amazing. But the rest and is we, Mungo. And, and Hatter's quite a large area to check mm-hmm. out. So so do you go to like the Lake Hatter, Little Lake Hatter, or do you do you look at, you know, that broken, what is it, Broken Creek, that that part of the park, where do you go? We mostly go into the main visitor centre, the big lake at the bottom there, and then we go straight up through the middle, if we can, past Mournpool and the, the other small lakes, up towards the the top road, which goes out towards, where does it go? You know where I mean, road that goes right yeah. through the middle. But we only have a day there. The rest of the time is in Mungo, but... We try not to drive a lot on our tours because it's hard to see birds when you're driving, really. Do you walk around Mournpool? Do you walk around the whole lake or do you no, just no, walk? No, no. We don't hike for the sake of hiking on our tours. Everything we do is in order to see wildlife. So we will walk a short distance if we need to, you know, a kilometre or two, if there's a lot of wildlife going to be at the end of it or along the way. But we never do hikes for the sake of doing hikes. Um, we don't do drives for the sake of them. Either. We're much more like an African safari operator. So we're only going to places when there's wildlife, if there's likely to be wildlife. I couldn't care less about the tops of mountains or lookouts <laughs> or anything unless they've got something to see that you can't see halfway down. Another distant valley. Oh, where's the bird? <laughs> I used to travel with someone who would pull off at every scenic lookout and oh, kill. <laughs> How many different angles of the of the same valley can you can you see? I think I'd I'd rather check out the towns and then check out the you know the river the riverine locations but no we've got to go to look out yeah another place we love is the northern territory at the top end we did a fantastic tour up there for three weeks in the top end with a couple from the united states just as a private tour in 2019 and i don't know if you know mick jerram up there he was working with us he's based in catherine fantastic guy amazing birder he'd be really worth you talking to at some stage on a Thursday, Grant. Oh, last year. So He's been very busy. <laughs> yes, I think he is very busy. <laughs> I do think I, I sent him an email last year, probably before anyone had ever listened to any of the episodes, actually. Oh, well, now's the time. Exactly. But he gave us a list of things to do on this one day. I think we made it to two of them. We're so slow, but... We saw so much in those two places that we couldn't leave. You know, five hours later, we're still at the same spot and that's when we saw the big blocks of budgies after I think it was five hours there. We sat down, we had coffee, you know, we watched as the Gouldian finches came through. (laughs) It's like, why would you leave? Really? No. We're slow. Look, I I don't know if if this is the way you tend to be 
when you're not working. But I always like to go back to the places I've been before rather than continually wanting to go to new places because I, I like watching how places evolve and how they change and, and I, you know, the seasons. And Do you prefer to race around to new places or to, or to go to familiar watering holes? I love to go to familiar places because I think you see more when you've been there a couple of times before. You know the spot where the – oh, that's my partner just walking in. You know the spot where the Oriole was nesting last time. So you have a look up there and you go, oh, look, there's one there. And then you see everything else that's new as well. I do like to see new places too. So it's a juggle sometimes to choose whether you go to a new place or whether you go to the same place and you just have to do a bit of both. Yeah, that's the hard thing, isn't it? Whether you, and sometimes it's easier to go to the same place. And if you go to the same place, you might see more than you, than you saw before. So it's like colouring in in a colouring book. You can finish the drawing sometimes if you go back to the same place rather than start a new page. Yeah, so, it's great. So what have we got? We've got East Gippsland, we've got the Northern Territory, we've got Mungo. Where else are your, your specialty places? We've got a new one which is coming up, Exmouth Ningaloo in WA, which I think is fully booked actually. No, there's a couple of places left in September. And we went over there initially ourselves a couple of years ago to see friends who run Exmouth Dive and Whale Sharks. Great people very strong conservation ethic and we love what they do and I think we were there for about four days and we could not bear to leave there is so much wildlife around Exmouth and the Cape Range on land as well as in the water so the whale shark that we went there for was a tiny part of the experience. So we said to our friends over there, why aren't you doing land tours? My God, this is amazing. And they said, oh, really do land tours. So we put together a package with them. It's partly on boats, doing some private boat trips with them into the Exmouth Gulf as well as out into the reef because the Gulf is absolutely full of marine life. But people don't go in there on the regular sort of scheduled tours. But there's a good chance of seeing dugongs if you go into the Gulf and who knows what else. Wow, amazing. And we're going out to the Murren Islands as well to do some survey work on there. The Murren Islands are just off the Cape Range Peninsula. There's two islands and go and look for a bird list on there of that island and there's barely anything ever been done. <laughs> Scientists have done it, but regular you know, e-birders don't, um, don't get, well, they don't get there, I'm guessing. Is it part of a park or is it a private yeah, holding? Part of the park. And what do you expect to see there? Ah, good question. I'll be cataloguing every reptile I see because I think they're underreported in a lot of places, especially the arid lands. I'll be taking photographs of every plant as well that I can see because I think it's really important. From a bird point of view, I think Spinifex bird has been recorded on the Murren Islands, which would be a first for me. Yeah, it's really unexpected, I would have thought. Wow. Hang on. It makes me want to check on my bird list now. But there's some um, really interesting birds in that area, the Rufus crowned emu wren, the Rufus field wren, all there on the Cape Range. There's a chance they could be on some of these islands as well. Not very far. It's easy, close to the mainland, so it won't take as long to get out there. Snorkelers go out there. Divers and things go out there. So the underwater life's been you know, reasonably well catalogued, I think. But the land... Well, hopefully there isn't a, a big pest issue there, them being yeah. so, close to the, so close to the mainland. Or yeah. hopefully people haven't been dumping their unwanted cats or something out there. Crazy people do things like that. How far is that from the Abrolis? Oh, fair way from the Abrolis. Hang on a second. I can get you some of these details in fair amount of... And are we talking several hundred kilometres? Yes, from the Abrolis. Yeah. 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 
I would say. Now let's see. So so off off the tip of the Cape Range, so north of Exmouth, the Mural Islands are only ten kilometres off at the top of there, heading towards Onslow Barrow Island up there. Okay. And the the Abrolhos is way down over here. Where is that? No, oh, that's West Wallaby. Yeah, probably two or three hundred kilometres. Yeah. So you might have a few of the same species, but unlikely that that many of the bush birds are going to be the same. No, that would be quite exciting. And I had to talk to a scientist who'd done some work over there, and he said, "Yeah, it's teeming with life. Amazing." So. Yeah, I just really see. Even if we don't see anything that's that's rare or or endangered, I just think it's really important to fill in these gaps in Australia because we are a small population with a huge continent, and there really should not be a single square on eBird that's not had a survey done in it. Really, we should yeah. make a bigger effort. And one of the great things about going to an island that people aren't really interested in except for swimming around it is that you see an intact habitat and Mm -hmm. so you can see what it would be like if we didn't have goats and sheep and cows and rabbits and whatever not running around on on all these worn places Mm -hmm. on the mainland so that's part of the learning experience so if someone goes on one of your tours Mm -hmm. how many people are they going with? It's not like a, a bus of 45 people doing sing songs, is it? Oh, hell no. No, most of our tour groups are eight or less. Occasionally we go a little bit over if we're doing something special like x but they're very small groups. So if you take a, a group of eight, mm-hmm. how are you travelling? Is that like two two tricked out four-wheel drives or you take a, a four-wheel yep. drive and a mini bus? Yep, all of the above, yeah. All, Whatever all we can above. get hold of, yeah. Sometimes there's mini buses available. Sometimes there's four-wheel drives if it needs to be. It's The vehicle is something that needs to be comfortable and, and work, but it's certainly not our main focus it's just a means of getting from A to B in a certain amount of comfort and the same with accommodation with us we're not there because of the fancy accommodation look that's great when you're going for a honeymoon but we stayed in Timber Creek with these wonderful Americans in a motel room that was you know just basically managing we didn't care I mean, we saw gold, Gouldian finches and black bitten. I mean, why? And budgies. Oh, who cares what you stay in as long as it's clean and it has a dunny? That's right. Well, I always just take a swag. So I prefer to stay outside rather than inside. But, you know, but, yeah. so, but sometimes you have to watch the news, don't you? So. Well, it's lovely to stay in a place that's nice. If, if there's an option, we'll take it. But we no, I'd much rather go to a place that is absolutely full of wildlife and, and stay in a place that's a bit ordinary. And now for people who are curious to to maybe be part of your tours, I want to know generally who are your customers? Well, I'm biased, but they're awesome. They They are interested in everything. Generally, most of our clients are not full-on list tickers. And very happy to spend quality time with a really special bird rather than dashing off to tick another one, if you know what I mean. We have taken some list tickers on tours as well and we've had a ball with them. So so there's a bit of a blend there, but I think I think our you know, our, the bulk of of our clientele are in, just as interested in learning about different species of kangaroo, how to recognise different rock wallabies, reptiles, plants to some degree, and birds. So the whole thing, which is how we are as well as people. we If it's wild and it breathes and it's native, we love it. If it's a bull ant, you know, we love it. it it's there's no limits on that. Fauna is exciting and fascinating to watch and we love it. And before we had the COVID situation, we were most of your clients internationals? 
Yeah, about 99%. So how have you managed to exist where the only people available to go on your tours are Australians? How are you finding, well, have you had to shift your marketing message much and are you are you breaking into that domestic market now that people can't go to Paris or can't go shopping yeah. in Milan or yeah and what we're finding is really exciting is that is that Australians are renewing their interest in Australia as a result of this and it's not just that they're being forced to stay here and they've got no other option I think this there's been this build up of genuine interest in more of Australia that's been happening over a decade and this has given people a fantastic opportunity to explore that and to maybe get out of their habits of going overseas and get into a habit of staying here more often which is great so we were starting to work into that world a little bit because of trips like Exmouth and the Northern Territory and Mungo always had more appeal to Aussies than some of our other tours. So we were starting to work with that already. And then COVID gave us a fantastic chance to just think about what we wanted for the business and reset a lot of things that we just didn't have time to do before. We were so busy. It was a little bit crazy, actually, because Kid and Walk about pre-COVID was very successful and we were run off our feet all the time. So now we've had a chance to have a really good think about uh, where we want to go and make some ambitious plans, make some controversial decisions uh, about how we go forward and uh, test it out in a market that's completely new. I can't, resist, I can't resist controversy, Janine. So can you tell us a controversial plan or two? Yeah. We- by telling the market that it's conservation, whether they like it or not, we will lose some travel agents, I think. We will gain some and they will surprise us. The ones who jump on board, you know, in a big way uh, might not be the ones we expect, really. But we'll be saying no to some of the tours we used to do in the past and that has all and we already have actually and I know that's caused some disturbance in the marketplace can we talk can we talk about that because I'm not 100% sure what you mean so I'm pretty sure that most people won't be aware so what what do you have to say no to and what will what would cause a travel agent that had been a partner of yours in the past, because that's what it is, it's a codependency, what would cause them to say no about a conservation tour focus? Well, the big one is that we've effectively stopped running day tours and that's caused uh, a little bit of a disruption. We're- so so what was a day tour? Because you're, from what I could see is that most of your tours seem to be multi-day sort of expeditions. So does that mean you don't do day tours from from one of the locations that you visit as part of a, another tour? No. Okay. Yes. How does that work? Our most popular tour before COVID was a single-day tour starting and returning in Melbourne. And it went out to the west, to the Yuyangs, and went out to see koalas in the wild and kangaroos in the wild and uh, lots of other wildlife as well. And it, it was disgracefully popular. And, it was. I'm, I'm guessing that was sold as part of a package by by some other operator, so that they would do the penguins one day, and then the you'd do the kangaroo one, and then they'd go to a petting zoo or something on a different day is that yeah yeah it was an easy sell for people who are coming to australia for 14 days where you do two nights melbourne two nights sydney two nights in cairns so they don't have time to do any more than a day tour and we slotted in very nicely to that particular program so in saying no to those 
because we really believe that the amount of fuel involved in running day tours is hard to justify for an operator like ourselves. The impact of day tours on an area very close to a large city is really noticeable. And that the best way we can support our wildlife and our regions, our local communities, is to get people out of that radius, which means staying three or four days in a place like Orbost. Well, I can take eight people to Orbost for three nights, four days, and the town feels the benefit of those eight people. Whereas I can take eight people to the Yu Yangs, the town doesn't feel any benefit at all, really. Well, it does, but it's small. You know, it it's, might be the cost of lunch. Well, yeah, it's 10 cans of Coke, half a dozen pies and a few bags of chips. The yeah. equivalent of, exactly. Yeah. We hadn't talked about this beforehand, so it's really interesting that these things have come up. That I'm guessing when you say the fuel is hard to justify. You're not talking about the $85 or $150 as a business expense. You're talking about the miles, the carbon impact and the footprint that a, that a day tour leaves because you're there, I don't know, let's say you did 50 in a year. There are other operators who are going on different days so that that small patch of ground is being hit every day by a whole bunch of people gawking with binoculars or whatever and tramping on those paths, the compaction and all that kind of stuff. That is not good on any natural system. Here's an opportunity to be controversial. Do you think most tour operators even factor that in? When, like, do, do you think that they have that? the less than obvious impacts part of their cost-benefit analysis each year? I think that most small and medium tour operators in Australia, which, by the way, is 95% of them, are just managing to make a living. They don't have the luxury of making a choice like we've just made. That was where I was going to go. The imperative to turn a dollar overrides well, what you and I would say is doing the right thing, but that other people would say, no, it's a necessary compromise. Yeah. And unfortunately, the travel industry as a whole doesn't help them to make these decisions. So for so many years, Grant, I was trying to get the industry to book our extended multi-day tours. They loved us. They knew that what we did was great. They kept on telling us this. They came out on for mills to see the extended tours, loved them. Every client who went on them loved them. There was absolutely nothing standing in the way of those agents booking those multi-day tours except that it was a tiny bit harder. To yeah, it's harder and probably less profitable <laughs> per not, not no, more. Thing. They made more commission as well was, than multi-day tours, but it was a little bit harder for their staff because they didn't run every day. And when your staff are so flat out busy that they're barely making it through their quota each day, doing yeah. adding a little bit of complication but, just really makes it hard. But that's the rub, isn't it? Like it, I was going to ask you who the industry is because I think you were using the term industry, which I think of as a pretty catch-all phrase, but you were talking particularly about the travel agents, the booking agents. You weren't talking about the whole sort of ecotourism certified operators kind of industry. So we we should be particular about that. But then the other word you used there, which made my ears prick up, is quota. and that's how a lot of these things work, isn't it? That it's just on bums on seats. So, 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 yeah. the, so the only way around that is direct marketing, isn't it? Is that you need to get inbound inquiries, and I'm guessing that has helped you make the pivot because Partly. because Partly. you match up with the people with the same sort of objectives, conservation objectives, the same mindset your ideal client is probably going to find you rather than be sent to you. 
Am I on the right track there? That's part of it, but it's not all of it. We, by removing the day tours, we've removed the easy option as well. So we don't any longer allow booking agents to take the easy option and book our day tour. So if you want to travel with us, if your clients have heard about us, the three-day or the four-day tour is your only option. And guess what? They will book that because it is the best option they can take. Now, not as many of them will, but that's okay. We're good with that. The other thing is to work with the media, um, to work with Tourism Australia and the local state bodies to grow your profile and to talk to podcasters. That's right. <laughs> Because I am the media. <laughs> that kind of thing. Because the more well-known you are, the more people connect with you, the more likely they are to go, you know what, I think I would enjoy spending four days uh, with those people. They, their values align with mine. And I'm going to go to my travel agent and I'm going to say, you must book this four-day tour with a kid and a walkabout. I won't accept anything less. <laughs> and that's how we can shift the industry and still work closely with all these wonderful partners who we've been working with for so long. And when I was doing my, my homework on you, Janine, one of the gateways into your website is, I think it's Australian Wildlife Tours. Now, Gen Australian Wildlife Journey. Now, that that seems to be a, a conglomerate, a cooperative of like-minded tour businesses. Can you tell us anything about that? Is that a new, is that a new thing? Because I remember the first time I went to find your website, I wasn't directed to like this all-encompassing website. But nowadays, depending on which link I click, I go to a number of tour options. Well, that's, uh, as you say, a collection of independently owned wildlife tour operators in Australia. I set it up with a couple of really good friends in the industry who have a similar approach to running tours to wheat. So I still remember the phone call from Craig Wickham from Exceptional Kangaroo Island saying we should work together on something like this. I said, yes, we really should. And then uh, Sab Lord up in the Northern Territory, Lord's Arnhem Land Safaris, he was the other founding uh, member of that. So the idea was that... All of us are independent and locally owned and we will never have the marketing power on our own that some of the multinationals do. But a lot of people want to travel with a locally owned operator who's independent and a lot of people know that the money you spend with a locally owned business is staying in the community that you want to help, you know, you want to go to. So we felt that that could be a, a wonderful thing. And also we were concerned that in Australia, the differentiation between captive wildlife viewing and wild wildlife viewing is not very clear. The big issue for me that, and a lot of organisations that get, that attract a lot of dollars from both corporate partners and government, sending mixed messages like, Having tourists stand next to a koala with some mana gum that's been pruned off a tree and hanging there or cuddling one, to me, that's not a conservation message. And that, and I, I can't remember who I had this debate with, but I, I'm sure it's on one of the episodes. That tells you indirectly, because every time you have the tourism minister do an announcement, or the conservation minister, whoever it is, do an announcement, standing next to someone hugging a koala, that tells us that the important thing is that there's a koala in the zoo. That's not mm. the important thing. The important thing is you can stand under a koala in a tree, in a wild place. That's the value. Mm. And, and, yeah, I have a real mm. issue. I don't know whether it rankles with you that it does it, it really does and it's the easy way for the government to get on air for the news mm. every night looking like they're doing something but they're not doing the right thing is my no. my view I mean, it does what? send a very strong message it also sends a message that animal really doesn't have any rights 
Why why are governments giving money to organisations like Australia Zoo? I don't have anything against Australia Zoo. Let's get that right out there. None of the private zoos, I don't have anything against them, but they're private zoos. Mm. So why is government money going to them unless it's a program run by the government that they get a bit of a bit of a part of, but it seems to be that they come up with a program and then the government funds them. Am I right? So far too much focus on it in Australia and we're not following the, we're not on message with the rest of our travelling public around the world, I'm afraid. Most of our clients from overseas, if they walked into an airport in Australia and saw a picture of a person cuddling a koala, they would be disgusted that a government would support such a thing that is well known to be, you know, irresponsible. If I walked into an airport in South Africa and someone was cuddling a lion cub, I would be disgusted. And as and it used to have that, and those were taken down because it's known to be just a bad message to give the world. Unfortunately, I think... Well, a lot of African countries have got this dilemma in that they go, come to our country and shoot our wildlife. Good for tourism. You know, we're preserving lions so that someone can shoot them and hang their head on the wall. It's bonkers. If uh, they're worth preserving, preserve them. And yet some of them, even with you know high levels of poverty, have managed to resist that. And I think no, there's no wildlife hunting allowed in Botswana. And I think that's that's still the case. But They've got much greater pressure than us, and yet they've been very strong in, in some of these, in, in some of this area. Australia can do a lot better, I think, with a lot of these things. So our clients don't want to go on a jumping crocodile cruise. Chook out for a crocodile. I mean, birders generally understand this very well. You can't tick it if it's captive, can you? You know, no brainer. And yet, for some reason, it's okay when it's a koala or a kangaroo. No, it's not okay. Seeing an animal in the wild has the most conservation value. And you indirectly or directly are supporting the places that have protected their natural landscapes. So we go to Orbost. You know, we love Orbost. It is surrounded by national parks and fantastic wildlife. Now, you can say whatever you like about the logging industry. It was very damaging. But those people over there who we go to see now have had a part to play in protecting their natural land and that's the, and they've got wildlife. So we go there and we support them. And that's how it should be. And if a community works hard to resist habitat destruction, to resist you know, housing developments that are unnecessary, they deserve to be rewarded by people like us coming to visit their wonderful place. That's what we do. And that, I know we're times marching on, but there, mm. there's one of the great conflicts that, and it's an artificial con- conflict, that if you're a greenie, you have to be against the people who are engaged in logging. No, you don't. And I don't think anyone sets that up. What you can be against is unsustainable logging, unsustainable practices. And what we need to all do is insist that any of those activities, be it four-wheel driving, be it be it anything, be it tour, gu- tour guides into any national park, into campsites, it needs to be done in a sustainable and light-touch manner. So if there's ways to do logging where it is not wiping out critical habitat, you can do that. But some industries are mature. Not every town has a printing press and a newspaper anymore because that industry has run its case. Co- run it. The only place you're going to see Cobb & Co now is on the side of a bus. You aren't going to see Cobb & Co on a stagecoach because some industries run their course and people need to be found an, another way to make a living. And it seems to me that people who know the forests can become yeah. essential yeah. parts of the tourism industry. We, yeah, we can't punish them forever for having had logging businesses. That just doesn't make any sense. They have transitioned, is my point. I'm actually against logging of native forests now. 
because I think the time has come for it to stop. The time came 20 years ago, I think. Yeah, and especially point, in some habitats. Yeah, some ha- yeah. some habitats can still manage some kind of harvesting, but not the clear felling that we're doing. It's no. bonkers. And so, you know, those we I think you've got to you got to look for the people who are doing the right things and support them. You so can't just can. boycott an entire town, you know, because one person did the wrong thing. The people who are doing the right thing deserve our support. Absolutely, and the carrot has to be out there. And mm-hmm. if people can make money out of uh, tours and preserving locations and improving facilities for bird nerds and animal nuts, you know, if if you can do that and you can turn a sustainable dollar, well, let's do it. Let's all do it. Let's all. <laughs> well, Janine, I know we've been going for ages, but do you want to do the bird emergency questions? Yeah, I'm having all fun. Right. Good. <laughs> Good. I know because you're not. Well, well, you, you are a self confessed bird nerd. So let's see. Let's see how we go. Favorite bird? Ah, it's whichever one is in front of me. Hard hitting journalism on the podcast. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll give you one. The favorite bird that I haven't actually seen yet that I'm dying to see is a Chatham albatross. Well, that's your bucket list bird. Oh, sorry. Okay. Favorite bird. Favorite bird. Favorite bird is painted honey eater. Painted honey eater. That's a ripper. That's a corker. Yeah. How long are they going to be with us? That's the big question, isn't it? Love the painted honey eater. I love the painted honey eater. I have to put a picture up for that one because yeah. heaps of people won't, won't know it at all. So your bucket list bird is the Chatham albatross. Have to do some cross have to do some cross promotion when World Albatross Day rolls around. And in the process, we did World Albatross Day last year where yes. we got a bunch of experts talking about albatrosses. This yeah. year I've set myself a challenge. How many species of albatross are there, Janine? Can you remember? Depends on the taxonomy that you choose. 14 to 19. Yeah. Yeah. Some people say 12. Some people go up to 22 even. But I'm trying to to do an interview with an expert on every species of albatross. So set myself a Well, hey, if you're into albatrosses, um, hit me up on Twitter or, uh, well, that's the best place to get me because I'm still looking for some experts on some albatrosses it's pretty hard oh i've got a few experts i know oh yeah yeah. send them over to me because yeah that's so that's going to be world albatross i'm glad you're into albatrosses don't lay a hand we are so lucky in australia it is just like living in albatross heaven go to tasmania and see the 10 species it's incredible i mean the only place that might be better would be new zealand but yeah. yeah new zealand What's your favourite piece of kit when you're out out looking at wildlife, out looking at birds? I'm a binoculars girl, um, not a camera girl. I, I don't go anywhere without binoculars, really. And I've got the little harness thing, the bra. Love it. I love it. Yeah. Certainly does. I need to have a hat on if I'm birding. There's too much glare if you don't have a hat. And have you got the have you got the neck bit? Are you protecting your neck with an? <laughs> Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> How about Steve? Has he got that as a fashion accessory under his hat? My partner? Yeah. Uh, oh, no. He goes commando under the hat. Very he just nice. gets a very brown neck. Very good. What field guide do you use? A, B, G. I resisted for a while. I was a Simpson and Day girl, but this one is so good. And if, are, you, are you migrating over to app, to the apps as well? You're using eBird? All the time. Yeah, all the time. Too much. So so as you see it, are you entering it or are you keeping a paper paper note as you go? Yeah, I'm using the mobile app at the time. I love it. It, It's so good. And it it means I list more often than I would do otherwise if I was double handling it. And I just do little lists all the time, you know, 20 minutes here, half an hour there. Not just in the backyard, but... Whenever I'm in a good birdie spot, I'll do a list and I love it. Do you know your number? World. Well, how you allocate your numbers are up to you. Do you, do you, are you keeping an Aussie list? Or, yeah. or, uh, so world, worldwide 1,200 and something. Good. But that's Africa and, and Australia, 500 and something. It's pretty good. You're well on the way. 
But the Vic list is maybe my most important list because I really want to get up to 400 in Vic. I'm not there yet, though. I'm still a, a way back in Victoria. But I just love my Victorian birds. <laughs> I just love seeing it, but in my own home state. Well, have, have you got a backyard list? No, I don't really have a backyard list. Port Melbourne. Uh, I don't know. Have you got the Eastern Spine Bill at home? I have had, yep. I saw one today, actually, down at Westgate Park, which is in my backyard. So, yeah, oh, yeah 347 in Victoria. Yeah, so I'll get there eventually to and 400. What, all right, well, the bucket list bird you've said, You've got an albatross, but what's your what's your bucket list Victorian bird? What's the Victorian bird that you haven't ticked off yet? That's an easy one. Oh, the rose crown fruit dove. Where where do you think you're likely to encounter that? I mean, it's going to be no, but there have been a handful of records of rose crown fruit doves in East Gippsland over the years who have only been found because they've hit a window and died or something like that. Mm. One has made it to Tasmania alive and was ticked over there by a bunch of people. Those birds are coming through Victoria, but they are not being ticked alive. Why? This drives me crazy. I think the answer to that is that they are moving through areas where there are not many people and they are not birds that demand your attention. You need to be out looking for them. Yeah, I think that we've got probably, I think in eastern Victoria there's still probably a lot of birds that are moving around that just haven't been seen, you know. I agree. I've spent the last few years on this project trying to figure out where they might be or what they're eating uh, and I've learned so much doing it. It's been a fantastic journey. I may never see them with my own eyes, but if someone else sees one alive, I will just be so happy. So what do you think's been like your most exciting get in Victoria? Let's keep it focused on Victoria. When what, What's giving you the most, the, the biggest thrill when you've been able to enter an into eBird? Good honey. And where did you see that up near Mildura or? The Yuyangs. Saw that in the Yuyangs. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, they get around. It, I think it remains the only sight record in the Yuyangs. There was a herd record a few years before me. I was, this was quite a few years ago, and I was out there and looked up and saw a bird that I didn't immediately know. And in the Yuyangs, I know all the birds. And I was just shocked. I thought, I've seen this in the book somewhere, but what is it? So I sent a photo on Twitter, actually, to, to someone, and they say confirmed it as a painted honey eater. I was stoked as anything. And I mean, Grant, this was a few years ago. I wasn't as ke- I wasn't as keen as I am now. And this was just a complete spin out. I, I was wrapped. Yeah, that's that that's a great a great record. But I, I do think that I do think that they're probably in more localities than than we expect because they do follow the blossom. And well, they're not a cryptic bird, but but they are hard to see. I, I think the same thing about fry birds in Victoria because I think everyone just thinks, oh, no, it's a bloody wattle bird. So yeah. just see, it. yeah, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. The yeah. only way you can tell is if you get a photo or if you That's record right. them. That's right. All right. Well, I think oh, your bucket list location. Where would you? Where do you want to go that you haven't been? To go and look at birds. That's easy as well. I was, oh, there's two. Can I have two? Yeah, you can have two buckets. you got two arms. The first is the Broome Bird Observatory, which I was planning to go to just as COVID hit. Oh, I'm gutted because I still haven't got there. I love shorebirds. Oh, gosh, I love shorebirds, especially big flocks of shorebirds. <laughs> I just can't wait. And the other one is Bremer Bay, the pelagic trips that a friend of ours does, the Naturalist Charters trips, where they go out to see the orca to the way east of Perth. We were ready, we were booked to go there in April 2020 for my 50th birthday. Now, I just, I just had a cursory look at my, at my atlas, way east of Perth. Way east of Perth, right. Over near 
Fitzgerald River National Park towards the great the Great Australian Bight. Ah, oh, okay. So southeast of Perth. I was just yeah, thinking. Yeah, yeah. If the orcas have started to, to catch the Indian Pacific, where are we going? And they're seeing some interesting petrels out there. And wow. I think, again, seabirds, shorebirds, because there's comparatively so few people in the places that those birds are, that I think there's many more than uh, that are visiting our shores than we ever know about. And who knows, on some of these remote places, maybe they're breeding, we just don't know. Oh, it's a world of discovery. What oh, better way? What better way to discover our wonderful Australian bird life and more generally our Australian world, then hitching up with Janine. Janine, how, what's the best entry point for someone who wants to have a look at what you've got coming up? Are you happy for people to seek you out and ask some questions? Maybe there are some questions that we haven't covered in the podcast. You know, there yeah. might be the odd other question that someone wants to ask. For instance, do you make damper and have sing-alongs on your... No. How can you be an Australian troop and not make damper and have a sing-along? Right. If you want to make the damper, I'm very happy to eat it. Vegemite, it's really nice. But, yeah, I'd love to chat. I, I love Twitter, actually. Twitter's great questions and things like that. So I'll make sure I keep an eye on both of the platforms after this. And uh, the website's the best way to see what we do. So, well, you have to tell people what your Twitter handle is because you haven't got yours up on the screen like mine. No, naughty me. It's uh, at Echidna Walkabout underscore. That's a really annoying one. But Why? You've got an underscore at the end of at the end of it because someone had called themselves Echidna Walkabout. Because one of our staff set up an account. No, no, I'm thinking of Instagram. Sorry. No, it's Echidna oh. W. Oh, sorry. It was Instagram. Someone lost the password. Echidna W. Yeah. That's, that's easy. So check out Janine on on Twitter because Twitter's a really in, – in the nature world, in the bird world and whatnot, Twitter's a really cool place to hang out yeah. on. But, you know, bird Twitter's really good. People don't tend to be obnoxious. So unlike political Twitter, which it's just a cesspool, I resist it sometimes because <laughs> conservation <laughs> is now inherently political. Yes, it is. Um, you have to be. So let's just – and on what's coming up for this year, Janine, what's your, what, what do you hope to be able to get done in 2021, even with COVID buzzing around and our borders closed? Well, I've got 45,000 trees to plant. Oh, uh, we haven't even covered your tree planting. Goes. I've, um, I've got 22,000 of them uh, around the Yu Yangs and we're being set back by a week because of this lockdown, which is irritating. But anyway, we'll find a way. And then we've got Exmouth to go to, and then we've got the Top End, and the Catherine Bird Festival is on just after our Top End tour, so we're going to go to that as well. Goldie and Finch. We've got, we've got a couple of Goldie and episodes about to come out tonight. Hooded parrots and so many other things. Oh, oh my God. Magnificent, magnificent. Well, birders, bird nerds, if you are contemplating a tour, now, if and if you're not confident that you're going to get value out of going on your own to any of those places, mm -hmm. that's really the, the yeah. main, is hook up with someone who knows where to go. Got spies on the ground everywhere too, mm -hmm. letting you know where things mm -hmm. are. Yeah, so so that's, that's how to ensure you have a great birding holiday. If the borders open up quickly and you're overseas, look up your name. Of course, there's going to be links in uh, everywhere where I get to get to put links. And Janine would love to hear from you. I've really enjoyed speaking to you, Janine. Thanks so much for all of this time. I hope we can talk again. Keep me updated whenever you see anything amazing or something funny happens, or yeah. you can anything, any kind of development. <laughs> Thank you, hey, Alyssa. This is our first tour guide Thursday. Tell us if you want me to keep it going or if you want me to kill it. I hope it keeps going because we want to really expose some of the options for you if you want to get out and about other Thank than you. going to Australia. Zoo. Thank you, Grant. Appreciate the opportunity, really. It was good of you. It's been a pleasure and I'm sure there's... 
you you can tell a story. There's no doubt about that. This is the Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams. That's been Janine Duffy. See you later.